Welcome everyone to today's Echo Voices session. It's February 7th, 2024. Today, we're going to be hearing from Jennifer Dundon of the ODE and Jennifer Smith of Oregon Health Authority regarding Medicaid-covered school-based health services and assistive technology. There's more to that uh, title, but that's the brief one. And I'm going to turn it over to you ladies. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that? It's working, thank you. All right, good, <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Um, we're really happy to be here today to discuss school Medicaid and assistive technology. As um, Chandra mentioned, my name is Jennifer Dundon and I'm a school Medicaid operations and policy analyst at ODE. I've been there for about five years now working in school Medicaid. And I'm here with my counterpart from the Oregon Health Authority, Jennifer Smith. Jennifer, if you wanna give a little intro. Sure. Hi, I'm Jennifer Smith, and I'm an operations and policy analyst with Oregon Health Authority Health Systems Division. I'm currently covering school-based health services. I'm pretty familiar with the program. I've worked on it before, and I've been with Oregon Medicaid for 15 years. Okay, so today we'll have a brief housekeeping slide um, and then get right into the meat of the presentation about school Medicaid and assistive technology. We'll have a little overview, provide some examples of billable and non-billable services, go through procedure codes and then documentation requirements. Um, we'll hold space for Q&A as well. And as, again, as Chandra mentioned, um, I'd like to start off by saying we'll do our very best to answer all of your questions. However, there may be some that we won't be able to answer right away, and we'll make sure we get any follow-up responses sent out along with the presentation, or perhaps you can access the presentation in this platform. Um, uh, so please feel free to raise your question throughout the presentation if you have any questions. Um, you can also put questions in the chat. And as I said, we'll hold space at the end for additional Q&A if there is any. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to the other Jennifer. All right, so just a few required elements for billing assistive technology uh, to school Medicaid. So the child must be enrolled in Medicaid and eligible under IDEA. Uh, the service must be on the IEP or IFSP. And that service that's listed must include the frequency, duration, and the location of the service. The service must be provided and documented by medically qualified staff within the scope of practice of their licensure. So the documentation must follow board rules I know that it's very similar in the school setting, like with the notes that are taken in the school setting, it's very similar to the board, but it must be board uh, notes. The service must be considered a covered service for school-based health services, Medicaid rules, and the parent must have provided written, not must have been provided with written notification and give consent for that Medicaid billing. All right, so just a little bit about assistive technology devices. So the device itself cannot be billed to Medicaid. So the purchase of the device, um, that can't be billed to Medicaid, but Medicaid reimbursement dollars can be used to purchase AT devices. And this is just a little bit about the coverage specifically for assistive technology services. And I included a link in the slide to the rule that covers this. Um, it's five in the rule. So the authority does reimburse school Medicaid providers for assistive technology services that are directly assisting a Medicaid eligible student with a disability eligible under IDEA. And as specified on the IEP or IFSP in the selection, acquisition, or use of the device. So that includes uh, the assessment for the, for the device. So that requires and includes preparation of a written report. Also care coordination. So any care coordination that you do with the student, the family, a physician, to for that student to have the assistive technology device, that care coordination is billable. 
And then training or technical assistance provided to or demonstrated with the child. All right, so just a few examples of uh, this one's a billable service. So a student receives AT services by or under the direction of a supervising SLP through training in the use of an AAC system. The service is on the IEP as a related service. So this is billable because it is on the IEP and the student received training by or under the direction of medically qualified staff within the scope of practice. Jennifer, I have a question for you. Uh, when we're talking about assistive technology, of course, that's a wide range of uh, topics and, and technology. And mm -hmm. in Echo Voices, of course, um, we are talking mostly about OGCOM and communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm just wondering, is there a distinction when we're looking at the um, medically qualified staff? I'm believing that it, if it is uh, for OGCOM, that an SLP needs to be uh, the one who is uh, par at least listed with the assessment um, for Medicaid billing. Is that correct? Yes. So medically qualified staff is a more general term. But yes, it would be an SLP if it's OGCOM. Specifically for OGCOM. And mm -hmm. so then with other assistive technology, you know, a lot of our practitioners come through uh, a lot of different doors to get to be assistive technology specialists and practitioners. Is there anyone um, under uh, anyone or is there any category or title uh, for that those assistive technologies um, that is required for other things like um whatever the assistive technology may be aside from OGCOM? So the, the general rule is medically qualified staff within their scope of practice. Okay. So if it's within the scope of practice for the therapist or pathologist, then that is fine. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes. And so an okay. assistive technology specialist isn't always recognized as a medical um background, but because of their expertise, it would still be something if they're recommending with a team. Um, I, I just, I don't want to get too in the weeds with what, but I just want to make sure because we have a lot of titles um, across our state. Okay. And if you can pop that title into the chat, I can do a double check as well. And we do have a couple of For questions sure. already. Um, do do the same rules apply to the IFSPs? Jennifer, are you still there? Oh. And was do the same rules apply to IFSPs? Yes. Yes, they do. And then Joanne asks, am I, uh, I'm, she's not an OT, but OTs uh, are medical, medically qualified. Their scope is activities of daily living. And so she's wondering about communication skills. So do you have, so a, I'll ha go ahead. Yeah, I'll have to look at that one. So it, the general rule is that if you're operating under the board rules, in addition to this, so if and, and I would have to look into the OT question for sure, because I don't know the board rules. I do know the school based health services rules fairly well, been covering for a little while, but I'd have to um, get back to you on that one. OK, thank you for sure. And that's all the questions I see for now. OK, thank you. So uh, the next example is an occupational therapist that's working with a student's parent or guardian, physician, and Oregon Health Authority in support of the purchase of an AT device using the family's community Medicaid benefit. So this is the care coordination that I was referring to on the other slide. So this is a billable service because it's being provided by medically qualified staff and is considered care coordination. 
So uh, what would the cover sheet on the IEP or IFSP need to look like? OT for care coordination or OT for direct or what would the service on the cover sheet look like? Because it has that has to be there before we can build too. Whoops. Jennifer, should I let you speak to that or? Well, it could be written under um, program modifications and supports for school personnel. That would be one way to put it in there, the same as you would write um, kind of any kind of training that the SLP or OT or PT would be providing to staff or things like that. So that's one way to do it. Um, if that's helpful. That well, that would be great, Jennifer. In our district, a lot of those uh, accommodations and modifications are on, I work under IFSP, so it's on an ECSC page. So uh -huh. it's not the cover page. It's okay. a special page for accommodations and modifications. And I'm not sure that our Medicaid department or software looks at that page because often I see services I, I bill and think are billable being changed to non-billable. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so for Medicaid, it, it it doesn't necessarily matter from Medicaid's perspective where it's written in the IEP or IFSP as long as it is there and it's providing okay. specifically qualified staff and it's got frequency, duration, location. So, um, but that's an interesting, I we are starting to have some meetings with Courtney from ECWeb. And so um, I'm hearing from you that depending on where things are written in the IFSP, they may not be billed. Is that what I'm understanding? I'll check I'll check with my Medicaid guru here at Northwest Regional because I think we have some glitches in the Medicaid system. And okay. we, we didn't in the past, but we do now. So something seems to be changed. It can't keep track of combination of minutes and, and time and whatever, but I'll check with my coordinator. Maybe yeah, it's on our end then. If you're comfortable, um, if, if it is an issue, if you're comfortable sharing that with me, I'm happy to try to check in with Courtney about maybe how we could look into that at least to see if there's okay. something. Like that. And then Chelsea, I want to, you have a comment here and I want, I think we want to clarify it too, is sort of clarify under school-based rules, OT could not bill for OGCOM. And I, I, that's really not what I what I was saying, and we'll have to dig deeper into this, but I think that uh, an SLP needs to do the assessment. And so as far as the other supports with that, um, it, it, I'm not going to say that it can't be an OT, but Jennifer's, uh, you may know better, but it may be something that we really need to uh, check into at this point. Is that right? Right. And I can, I can dig deeper. The bottom line is, as far as board rules go, so OT board rules, if it's within the scope of practice for an OT, then it can be billed by an OT or rendered by an OT. Same thing with physical therapist, SLP. If it's under the scope of practice, then that is a medically qualified staff that can provide that service. Is that helpful? Does that help, Chelsea? It is. And I missed the uh, assessment. I'm like, okay, yeah, outcome assessment versus outcome treatment. That makes sense. And I think that's kind of a national move that, that, that was it was done that the assessment needs to be part of needs to be done with or by an SLP. So we'll get clarification on that. But I just wanted to make sure that 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 was out there, not to yeah, be confusing. Thank you. That, thank that you. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, if you want, I can help with that because I have a relationship with the OT, PT, SLP, and nursing boards, and I can ask them directly. That might be easier than trying to interpret rules. <laughs> Just ask yeah. them. So I can that would be great. That. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. There are Chandra, if you're on, if if you are able to. Um... I you am. can go ahead with the questions. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't mislead in talking about the SLP role. So uh, feel free to jump in there. My my internet connection does seem to be um, a tiny bit unstable at times, so I apologize. Um, but there was another question about um, do the services for AAC need to be listed 
as AAC specifically, or can it be generic speech services? So the best way to look at this, um, I think, is to realize that the IEP and the IFSP are the prescriptive documents. So when you're billing something, it needs to be listed on there. So um, it doesn't necessarily, I don't think it necessarily has to say AAC, but, you know, speech therapy devices, programming, all of that kind of stuff with minutes sufficient enough to do all of those things. Shani, does that, does that help answer your question? Um, yeah, it does. I, I'm just thinking within the um, constraints of having an IF, of the IFSP paperwork and the way it's listed in EC Web, I think, I think this is why early childhood programs haven't been billing for AAC because it's really difficult to capture that on the document. So I guess that's a conversation okay. with. Uh, yeah. Could you tell me a little more about that? Like it, about the issue with writing it in, is it, is it because you usually write it in a different area and EC web just pulls from that summary page or something like that? Is that the problem with it or? I think it's, it's that on the cover page, it would just list speech therapy and direct or consult in a number of minutes, and it doesn't get into any specifics about devices or programming or anything. Um, where that information could go is on the um, ECSE page where it has supports for school personnel, and that's where the AAC services are listed, which means it's not a direct service. Um, and I... My what I understand about that is that it's not billable because um, you're supporting you're supporting school personnel rather than the student. If the student's present when you're training them on how to use that device with the child, that is billable. Okay. So, um, and I yeah, and so I understand for streamlining of billing, especially if you're using a billing submission platform, it's nice to have everything listed in that cover page or services summary page for an IP because then the softwares can validate against what's in it. But, you know, assistive technology is going to be written, you know, up in present levels and for K-12, that's my area of specialty. I'm not, I'm less fluent with IFSPs, but um, it's reflected throughout the document. Um, and Medicaid just needs to see that there's been an assessment done. There's a need for it. It's being provided by medically qualified staff and you do need the minutes, the frequency, duration, and location but where it's written, I think, is less important as far as that goes. I think the issue would be how billing is done. And that's what I think I'm hearing with the EC web system. So um, I'm happy to have conversations about this. Thank you. Yeah. We want to try to maximize the revenue. <clears throat> Lots to align with yeah. to, to get everything billed. Okay, so another example, an OT teaches a student's general education teacher and educational assistant how to support the student's use of their adaptive keyboard. The student is not present. So this would be a non-billable service because the student was not present during the training. So Jennifer, can I, I'm sorry, can I ask you a question about that? I don't know if you can hear me. I'm sorry, the students okay. are on here. Um, You're fine. So, so for that, if it's, um, if you have like consultation services under supports for personnel, um, like OT uh, consultation services. So if, um, so the student has to be present for that consultation service, you're saying uh, to be billable. But if I'm just, you know, talking to the teacher you know, on the side and the student's not there, then that's not available. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? That is correct. Okay. The student right. needs to be present. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next example is part of an eligibility determination for a student. A PT conducts an evaluation assessment of a student and determines that the child needs AT to access their free and appropriate public education. This is billable because it's an evaluation 
being conducted by medically qualified staff pursuant to IDEA. I, I, so I am a PT and I will, I find that one questionable. We might, PTs might bill for positioning or where the AT mount will be on the wheelchair for that child to access the device, but we wouldn't be billing for AT training. I, I don't know any AT that really, we, we would refer that to the SLP or the OT. It's, I, I don't believe what, what that example uh, the way it was worded is actually covered in the PT Practice Act for the state of Oregon. <laughs> but that's why I'm okay. here. Uh, I'm here to learn more and get your take on it. Yeah, I, so, so I think this example was more created to um, not necessarily speak to board rules about PT or OT or SLP, but it's the evaluation and assessments. So if, if that should be a different medically qualified staff lift, listed in the example, we can do that. But this is part of the assessment that is billable. Okay, so if the IEP or IFSP says a student ha will have access to a portable word processor for note taking in their general education classes. So it's written just like that in the IEP or IFSP. This would not be billable because simply providing access doesn't meet Medicaid requirements. Again, the IEP IFSP is the prescriptive document showing that Medicaid covered services are being provided. So training the child in the use of the portable word processor by medically qualified staff would be billable if it was written into the IEP or IFSP. So we do have, and backing up um, one slide back to that previous one mm -hmm. for billing purposes. The assessment. Is, it, yeah, is an assessment related to an eligibility or is it also the assessment that happens in every session. And it it sounds sure to me as a lay person that you're talking about your evaluation when they're working on an IEP. Is that what we're talking about? My question is about um, the uh, billing requires and for a particular service requires an evaluation and or assessment and and which assessment does that refer to is it a, is it a formal assessment is it eligibility or is it just the assessment that's like part of your soap notes in your day in your regular visit I think so i i think in these examples the child is covered by Oregon Health Plan, and they've already been under IDEA, they've already been determined eligible to receive special ed services. So the eligibility has already been determined, and then either the OT or their speech therapist comes in to do their assessment or I'll calm on what kind of device is needed. So we're mixing up the term eligibility with an evaluation for eligibility classification versus an assessment by a related service provider or the speech therapist or the OGCOM specialist. I think we're mixing up our terms. As part of the eligibility determination for a child, um, IEP teams are required to determine whether or not the child needs assistive technology. It's one of the special factors. So the this maybe wasn't written the way that it, it should be more clear, but it is related to the PT's assessment about a child needing assistive technology as part of that eligibility determination because as part of the eligibility determination for the IDEA you're required to consider whether the child needs assistive technology so that's what this one is about uh, again Jennifer I'm sorry the only time PTs are uh, really involved in eligibility determination is if the student is orthopedically impaired it in at least in our district and practices, and that's kind of I I've, I've worked in a lot of different states. That's kind of wherever I've been. Otherwise, there's other more qualified, uh, medically qualified staff. 
Well, it can this, be, this, this my is understanding just is it can be a multidisciplinary team that makes a decision about what the child <clears throat> needs. And so I, like I think Jennifer said earlier, if if PT shouldn't have been put here, then we can obviously work to adjust that. But it well, and and that's the disconnect between OHP and ODE. They're in in most schools and education service districts. We only have one or we only have two people on the um, evaluation team for eligibility. It's not a multidisciplinary team because we're we have these timelines and we're get, we're finding them eligible. Yeah. And, and then it, down the road with a with like a with an overall eligibility that's an umbrella, and then down the road we fine tune that eligibility. And and I know <laughs> that in best practice it should be a multidisciplinary team. So uh, when I Jones realize that, but in reality, hands, we, yeah, we have, I, um, yeah. Hi, Wendy. What do you? Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I just I just wanted to jump in. Um, because just wanting to consider and define like what is assistive technology, I think those of us, you know, myself included, who potentially have been a PT for 20 plus years, like when we think of assistive technology, we just think communication devices. But now yeah, but the way assistive technology is defined, it's even in the, it's the equipment that we, yeah. the positioning yeah. equipment, the gate trainers, the standards. So I think this is a very valid to me, reading this example, it's a very valid billable service for me as a PT if I'm determining and assessing the need of a student's positioning equipment or motor equipment. That does get defined under assistive. Yes, um, this, AT this example is it's talking about assistive technology, not specifically AAC. So I right. think we've uh, I think we we've got that, and we can probably go to the next slide. I think we did this one, so. Mm -hmm. So we'll get into the billing. Procedure codes. Yay. Here we go. All right. So there's a link on each of these pages where I'm talking about the procedure codes for different things that goes to the procedure codes modifier billing matrix online. So I wanted to make sure that was in there. So billing Medicaid for AT evaluation assessment. The procedure code is T1024. Uh, the specifications must include one-to-one -one student contact time. It must be rendered by medically qualified staff within the scope of practice. Requires and includes preparation of a written report. And then modifiers, those are on the billing matrix. There's a lot of them, so I didn't want to list each one out. But you'll define the service provider on the claim with the appropriate modifier for that service provider. And then just a few notes, assessment evaluation time is separate and does not count against AT service minutes on the IEP or IFSP and can be performed by medically qualified staff over multiple service areas to meet the needs of the child, such as OTPT, SLP, and or audiologist. All right, so programming. Programming is included in um, the service. So we have a couple of different codes specific to programming. 92606 is a non-speech generating device. 92609 would be a speech generating device. And the specifications are therapy service for use of device with programming. So again, the modifiers, this is just generic across all the slides because there are a lot of them, um, but that defines the medically qualified staff that provided the service, the modifier on the claim. And just a few notes on this, uh, the build time cannot exceed AT service time on the IEP or IFSP. So any kind of routine maintenance, programming or modification of the device needs to be included in those minutes on the IEP or IFSP. Okay, and this so is training. We, Go ahead. we do have a question really quick. Um, mm -hmm. So Shani, did you want to unmute and ask this question yourself? 
Sure. Yeah. So on this slide about programming, it looks like um, that you do have to have AT service listed. Does, do you mean AT service or whatever the um, uh, the service line is? O, the OT's programming, it could be OT service. It could be any of those things. It's, it's basically, um, it's included in the therapy. The therapy, including programming, is these two specific codes. So it doesn't have to say necessarily AT. It's a prescriptive document. So it's it's whatever the actual device is, whatever the actual service is, is in the IEP and can be related to one of these codes. It can be billed under those minutes. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. All right, and for training, our procedure code is T1018. Training must include the one-to-one -one student contact time, must be rendered by a medically qualified staff within the scope of practice, again, with the modifiers. And uh, again, build time for training cannot exceed the service time listed on the IEP IFSP. So device training time needs to be listed there. And then training time could be demonstrating and instructing the use of a device or adaptive equipment. I see a hand up. We have a Chelsea, you have a question? Yeah, this might be too in the weeds, but um, so we, the model that we use is we put um, AT in consult. And so what this is telling me is that I need to be putting AT in as a related service, because if I'm trying to bill for one-on-one -on -one student contact time, I don't think that that would count under consult. Do you know that? Jennifer, think, do you want to? Yeah. Well, okay. well, it sounds like for Medicaid billing, as long as it's listed in there with the frequency, duration, location, and provided by medically qualified staff and documented, I think if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, are you saying you need to write it in related services instead of where you normally write it? Yeah, I'm just under the impression that um, consult does not include any like one on one. Um, contact with the student. So if I'm trying to bill for one-on-one -on -one contact, I don't know if that would get flagged. Yeah. Well, I think if if you are having one-on-one -on -one contact time with the student, then you would be able to bill for this. Um, I know that we run into, we run into a lot, the, the term consult versus care coordination. And so the Care coordination is the billable Medicaid, that's billable to Medicaid, but if you call it consult, it, it, it isn't. And so if you're doing like a consult only model um, with no contact with the child, that is how you're doing it. That's your district decision or whatever, but that won't be billable. So that, I guess, is that what you're asking kind of along those lines? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of what it's sounding like to me is, you know, if, okay, thank you. <laughs> I am, I'm sorry, before we jump on, I have a question. So in our program, um, we uh, kind of moved to a model and now I'm kind of like thinking maybe we're not doing this correctly, <laughs> but we uh, had moved our minutes mostly, not all, but, but mostly to consultation. And we tend to have the student present, like our mm -hmm. In our mind, we want um, a staff member to be present and the student to be present so that we are um, training them on how, like, maybe if I'm trying to work on access for a specific device, maybe it switches and, and step scanning. You know, I want that person who's going to be supporting the, the student, you know, all day long in the classroom to be there because I want to train them and, and with the student. And I want to look at how they, they've been working with the student. And so is and we have just put on our... IEP that that was, you know, OT consultation. Uh, we, we didn't put care coordination and we've been billing that as such. And so is that not okay then? Um, Jennifer can speak to that, but my understanding is that as long as what you're doing is actually care coordination, 
you can bill for it. And what you're doing is you're with the child present with the teacher and whoever else you're doing the training and support with. And so that is care coordination and there's not a problem billing for care coordination, even if you write it as consult on the IEP. But Jennifer, you can... Right. And also your your notes are going to qualify that mm -hmm. procedure as well, because your documentation, so the, the IEP or the IFSP is the prescriptive document, but then your note taking is training this person, that person, student press. I don't, I don't know because I'm not medically qualified staff, uh, very policy minded, but your notes are going to back up that services as well. Okay. But I guess just moving forward then, like in, mm -hmm. in talking to my colleagues that maybe we should be putting um, care coordination instead of consultation on the IEP, it sounds like. Um, I think we're not wanting to direct how anyone writes right. IEPs because the or disrupting any kind of uh, district or ESD policies or EIE CSE program, it, um, we can just tell you what is needed for Medicaid. And it doesn't sound to me like there's a problem with the way you're currently writing them and providing the services. Um, okay. So it, uh, I would I would hesitate for Medicaid to drive uh, that, I guess is how I would say that. That's what I... Okay. Well, I, I think that it's been covered. Like I haven't gotten back from our Medicaid director that it like wasn't being covered, but I just wanted to make sure that we're, because we feel like this service, like that is, is the best for our students. I mean, and again, this, the student is, is almost always there we, again with that staff member is what we're trying to, mm -hmm. to carry over that training. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. So then we have a question about assistive technology specialists as they are not always OTs or PTs or therapists or I medically qualified staff, right? So does do the licensing, um, I'm sorry, does Medicaid recognize that role? I think that all? might have been related to or close to another question. I'm going to have to look into that one. Okay. Yeah. Jennifer, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was just thinking about this. Um, actually, Linda Williams, before she retired, after we had talked with you, Chandra, she was like, because you had referenced a cert an assistive technology specialist that wasn't no TPT or SLP, but it was some type of certification. And her intention had been to look into that to see if those, if they could be added to the list of medically qualified staff. And since we are, well, we, OHA is going to be opening up their school-based health services OARs. We are looking into adding additional provider types to be considered medically qualified and billable. And so um, I think it'd be really helpful if you wanted to send some a list or something like that of staff that regularly provide this type of service. And we could look into whether or not their um, licensure and scope of practice would, we could basically get them approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to be included. Okay, well then I will ask for my Echo Voices audience's assistance with those titles. Just throw them in the chat and I'll gather them up later and, and we'll get them over to, to you guys to see if we can get those approved. Especially because I think the one you were talking about was like a national certification or something like that. The more. Yes, it was a national certification for assistive technology. Um, I don't Such remember. as Resna. Thank you. Yes. Resna. Resna. Yes. Yeah. Among others. And I have a master's in assistive technology. So mm -hmm. people come to AT in different ways. That's just throwing yes. it out there. Well, that's good to know. And so if, especially if there's avenues where we can add additional available providers, that would be wonderful. So. Sorry, don't mean to hijack your conversation. Oh. It's all good though. Um, the well, it was your the... question, Deb, and you are very qualified to ask it. <laughs> yeah. And just lots of people um, who uh, are in those roles. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And we would really like to know that like, how is that operating in the school? What What's the availability? Because we really do want to maximize uh, Medicaid billing and make it as simple as possible for districts and as complicated as necessary because we don't work for the state. So, yeah. 
Simple as possible. That's what we're going for. All right, so just a little bit about documentation to support Medicaid reimbursement on the IEP or IFSP. So um, who, what, when, where, why, how, and what are the results? So who's the child? What methods and approaches are used to address goals and objectives? What's the therapeutic value of the service provided? When was the service received? Or when will it be received? Where was the service provided? <laughs> Why was the service provided based on the plan of care and support of IEP, IFSP goals? How was the service delivered? So the amount of time and minutes and then results. So what was the child st or student's response to the service provided? And then adjusting things accordingly with the service plan progress or lack thereof. And that was our last one. So if there's right. additional questions. Can I ask again that about that assessment piece? Um, it looked like uh, when I, there was a slide that I copied that looks like it said assistive technology assessment is required and includes preparation of a written report. Can, I don't know what slide number it is. It was at the beginning. It was but... before all, wait, was it before? No, it was no one of the, it was either one of the code slides. It this, might have been this. Yes. This. Okay. So this is the billing code specifically for an evaluation or assessment. So when billing this code, this requires and includes preparation of a written report. Okay. And so I'm just thinking for, from an IFSP perspective, um, the the assistive technology evaluation is um, often outside of the eligibility process and there may be a written report, but it's not attached to the IFSP. Um, often, as I understand it across different early ch childhood programs that the assessment report is not attached to the IFSP. Um, perhaps this is something that goes in the service log instead in order to have it be um, referenced cross-reference with Medicaid. So as I read this, this is, um, well, my most familiar piece with evaluation and assessment is that evaluation and assessment that's happening before the IEP is written. And again, um, I'm not as familiar with the IEP, IFSP documents. Medicaid is more creating a pathway to payment for those services that are being provided in schools. So this code requires preparation of a written report, but this code is specifically used for evaluation and assessment. And that's why it's not taking minutes off of the IEP IFSP because that's typically happening, I would think, before or reevaluation, those types of things. So I think what she's asking or saying is it would it be okay with Medicaid if that report or those service the documentation of that assessment is not necessarily in the IFSP, but could be if it was in the student's file. Is that sufficient or would it need to be somehow connected to the IFSP, I think, as well? Because it's not normally. You've got it. It, it okay. does. Okay. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Um, so as long as you have documentation, it doesn't necessarily have to be on the IEP or on the IFSP. It's supporting documentation showing that this service was provided. So where you keep that documentation in the event that we were to ask for it, you know where it is and you can send it over, right? <laughs> so I think that's fine. And I will highlight the, the piece about um, you would need parent consent ahead of time, of ahead of that, yes. in order to bill for that. I know sometimes 
the consent comes at like an initial IAP or IFST meeting. But if you want to be able to bill for those evaluations and assessments, um, you'd want to get consent ahead of time, the parent consent to bill Medicaid. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joanne, you had a question. Uh, uh, yep. Thanks. Let me lower my hand here. Um, and in our ESD, I believe all those intake evaluations, whether it's early intervention or ECSC, they're all billed to the school district that the child resides in. So when it's part of the full evaluation for eligibility, I don't bill at all for that. That gets billed as a package to the school district. I don't know how other people are handling that in their facilities. And, and then the school district has the choice that they want to pass that that billing on to Medicaid, maybe, but I doubt if they do. Yeah, that that sounds that sounds similar to what we do, I believe. Um. Was there a, a specific question? Joanne, was it more of a comment or a question? Was there a question in there? I'm sorry. It, it was a comment because oh. uh, sometimes I make comments just to make sure I've clarified it in my own mind and my own understanding. So those those initial evaluations, if I'm if I'm asked to be part of the intake eval team, which I am sometimes, I don't bill for my time during that evaluation or for the report that I contribute to because it's passed on that whole package is, there's a code, partial eval, full eval, full eval with translator. And it's a predetermined price that we pass on to the school district where the child or student resides. And I would just say that that um, there's a pathway to payment from from Medicaid. So the business decision of whether or not to take that path is up to the district or the ESD. So, Wendy, you had a comment or a question. I I actually have a question. Um, so our district does not bill Medicaid at this time, but I know that it's okay. always kind of um, as a possibility. <laughs> So what my question is, is if we're as a school district billing Medicaid, does this affect any of their Medicaid funding that they might have out in the community, like for home health services or um, outpatient therapies? Because I know there's, from what I understand, and I may be understanding wrong, there's like a certain pot of money um, that they, they get per year and just wondering like, if we have to be conscientious of what might already be built in the community as a school district and vice versa. No, okay. the school Medicaid funds are a separate carve out and it will have no impact on the family's benefits. That's actually in rule that it can have no impact on their benefits. And I'm going to follow up. Is there, I mean, granted, I haven't done like outpatient or home health in a long time. Is there a set amount of funding, like, are we as a school district going to max out between PT, OT, and speech, or is it unlimited? Unlimited. Unlimited as long as we have our minutes set correctly. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then, so I'm going to add one more question because I was looking at synergy and looking under related services. So we actually have a drop down item that's titled assistive technology. So is, and then you can assign the role. So if me as the physical therapist, if I wanted to bill for equipment fitting, I would need to have assistive technology listed as a related item. And then the role is PT and then the minutes assigned in order to bill for any like equipment fitting or um, fabrication or anything I did. Is that correct? Yeah, that's how I understand it. Jennifer, you might have a different take, but, um, yeah, that's also, yes. 
So you want to be as descriptive as possible in the IEP or IFSP, of course, um, because it is the prescriptive document. But yes, you would list it in there with the minutes and you would just make sure that you don't exceed those minutes. So. But conversely, like we said earlier, if you wrote it in as PT services and minutes and da da da, and then the background documentation supported what you're doing, there's that as well. Yes. So um, mm -hmm. like I said, we don't want Medicaid to drive the bus on how to write IEPs, right. but as long as it's clear that it's being provided by medically qualified staff, documentation supports what is happening. Um, that's basically what's necessary in order to bill. And Deb, you had a question or comment? Well, I just wanted to say too, that as we're talking about um, assessment and the question came up, are we talking about eligibility or a, assessment down the line? Well, I think that it's both. Um, most certainly, because uh, eligibility is determined, and if they're considering assistive technology, okay, that's part of that. But at any point, if the team feels that they need to consider assistive technology, in the IEP, um, it says assistive technology, yes or no. And so at any point, they can consider to say, we think that might be something we want to explore, uh, to do a trial basis. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that it could be both and doesn't always tie to um, the initial eligibility. Thank you. And uh, Kyla, you had a, your hand raised. Yeah, for, um, so for, um, you had said that if you're going to do an AT evaluation that you had need to get consent from the parent to bill Medicaid for that evaluation before you uh, complete that evaluation. Okay, so is that just like for an o an AT evaluation? Because I'm just thinking when we do like an an OT evaluation, you now we do get consent, you know, parent permission to do all testing, whether it's like for eligibility or you know an initial. Most of ours already have something in place before they come to us. I work for the CESD. Uh, K through post high program, and so, mm -hmm. but is that is that just for AT, or is it also like, are you saying like if we were going to bill for PT or OT services, or that that we also need parent consent to bill for Medicaid? Right? Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. what I was trying to highlight is the fact that you you can only bill Medicaid from the date of consent forward, and so sometimes what happens is the they the school district or program won't get consent until the child is found eligible. And so that rules out billing for the any of the eligibility evaluation and those kind of things that happen beforehand. And so, um, and you don't need a specific consent, just, okay, consent for AT, OT, PT, speech. you don't need that. You just need one consent for three through 21. You just get it one time for the most part. There's caveats there, but generally speaking, and then you can bill from that date forward. And so I was trying to articulate that if you want to maximize billing, you'd want to get that consent early on and before any of those assessments, because as I understand it, they're costly. And so it would be a way to recoup some of the costs. Okay. Okay. That, okay. That's good information. And so, so if we get it early when they come in as a kinder, then we don't have to get it until they age out of post high. Like it's just considered or in mm -hmm. to bring that. There's a few things that could happen. Like if the child moved away and came back or there was a change in parent and guardian, you know, there are caveats there, but in general, you just need to get that consent once. And then you send out um, an annual written notification every year thereafter. I do know in EI though, it is an annual consent, but age three through 21, it's just one time unless you're transferring again, like I said. So when a child transitions from ECSE to school, the, the district would need a new consent and things like that. But yeah. Okay. That's, that's helpful. We actually don't do uh, that consent. It we, it used to be that we received the funds for our billing. It came back to the ESD. And then a few years ago, we found out, oh, it actually is going to go back to the local districts, <laughs> which kind of sucks for us in a way. But um, so that, that piece of it sort of got taken out of our, our hands. So I just wasn't aware of, yeah, and I guess I maybe should also check in to make sure that that's still being done that, so that they're getting billed. But um, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joanne, you have your hand raised. 
Thank you. My last comment, I was going to tack on to what Deb said about eligibility and assessment. Um, so like we, again, we do the eligibility piece rapidly. So then if we, if during that initial eligibility evaluation or evaluation for eligibility, it's determined by the team that this child will likely need physical therapy or OT or OGCOM. Then we put that service like PT assessment, um, AT assessment, we put that on the cover page. So then that specialist has time to do that assessment. Um, Thank you. Then, <laughs> thanks, Joanne. Um, and then Deb put into the chat here, um, yesterday, the school Medicaid newsletter came out and there was a checklist in there for Oregon school districts to help complete the billing of Medicaid. Jennifer or Jennifer, do you guys want to talk about that for just a minute? Sure. We, we put together... It was the ODE, OHA, and our school Medicaid core team. We originally had created a checklist back in the day, but it was horribly out of date. And so we updated it and included additional information. And it's meant to help districts understand the steps and the processes needed in order to begin billing Medicaid. And so it's got, you know, enrolling, you know, provider enrollment. It's got parent consent. It's got, you know, reviewing IEPs and IFSPs. We also have developed cost benefit analysis and readiness assessment tools. So it's just kind of a way to help give a framework of the steps involved. And then obviously we, as we provide as much technical assistance and support as a district would like. Um, so do you want me, do you want me to put the link in the chat or would that be um, helpful? Okay. Deb has done that for us. And oh, okay. I know, um, All right, thanks. we do have a hand raised. Miss Rubin, would you like to say something? You're muted. You're muted. Am I still muted? No, nope, you're, you're not. Good. Okay. You're good. You were giving your best speech. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. Yes. <laughs> um, I just had a question about uh, the consent part. Um, and Jennifer, if you could point me to where my administrators could go to really define and understand the consent because we get consent every single IEP every year. And it's pretty, it's a real burden on our teams. So if there's a way that we could not do that, <laughs> I would love to help out the teams. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to put, you want me to send you an email or what do you think would be? That would, sure. That would be great. Sure. I have a couple, I have the parent consent itself has information in there. And then I did create like a parent consent infographic that will need updated once the school Medicaid rules are updated, but it's still a really helpful tool to, under, to explain what the consent and what it's for and that kind of thing to help families maybe be more inclined to sign it. So that might help the administrators too. So. Yeah. Cause if it's just one time between K and 21 outside of those instances that you were talking about, then, um, yeah, then that's yeah. a, completely you're, doing extra, you're doing extra work. <laughs> Cause <No> extra work. <laughs> yes. so yeah, thank you. I'll put my email in the chat, I guess, awesome. or if you want to, okay. Yeah. Oops. <sighs> Sorry. Oh my goodness. Okay. Thank you. And and I, from what I know, I would caution everybody because there's different types of consent. There's consent for Medicaid billing. There's consent every time you do uh, an initial eligibility or three-year reevaluation to continue eligibility. And those you definitely do need to do written evaluations periodically, not just once over the school age. So I think you're just talking about consent strictly for Medicaid billing, right, Jennifer? Yeah. Okay. 
I'm really grateful to both of you for uh, not only presenting, but listening to the responses because uh, the school environment is totally different. And as people have said, it's different across the state and the because it's left to districts to decide. And so I recently saw an email gathering information from those who who um, who prepare and submit for uh, reimbursement and they want clarity on things too. So I'm glad that uh, we are all talking to each other because um, there are probably some ways that we can all improve our processes. So thank you for that. Thank you for having us. And I did put links to, I saw in the same e uh, newsletter, there's a couple of webinars coming up. Uh, next week. You are probably going to share that. Uh, folks who are watching this recording uh, in the future, sorry, uh, but I have put the links to, there's uh, two of them next week. Um, and it, so certainly share it with your administrators and, and folks uh, to get an overview of where we're at. So thank you for that. Ms. Rubin, you have your hand yeah, up. Yeah, can I? Sorry, um, I was just wondering about the reimbursements. I don't know if that's the appropriate for now for for this forum, but are they different if for these AT codes than like the SLP? If I'm an SLP and I'm billing under some of the AT codes, is that reimbursement different than my SLP? Um, like receptive and expressive language disorder kind of codes or or my yeah one-on-one -on -one code jennifer were you gonna say something no I, okay I, okay so it's all dependent upon prior year audited costs so every district submits prior year audited costs and those are calculated and we enter into the system into the Medicaid system for those specific codes, the rate for your district based upon those costs. So I think what you're saying is that there's there's the SLP rate that the district develops and that's mm -hmm. the rate. And so it's gonna be billed in the increments. So no, it's not a different amount. Um, it's the same SLP rate based on those hourly cost rates. Right, and costs, when you bill it, it's by the minute. Okay. And so by the same token, if the OT was billing, then it would be the same OT rate if the PT is billing, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that like um, we might bill more for OT services than, than another ESD you might bill for OT services per minute? Yes, each district in ESD, EIACC program, they have different cost rates based on their costs from the prior year. And so um, there's an interesting range of rates across the state. And then, go ahead. I was going to say, that's just really interesting because it seems like it would be the same since it's coming from the government. <laughs> that, that no, it, no, each, yeah, you have your own rates and then districts, some districts programs bill more than others. So there's a quite a variation in amount. I have another question. Um, years ago, I during one of the ECHO TIES conferences, um, I know uh, the Medicaid conversation was presented as one of our sessions and there was the thought process that eventually all districts should be moving to billing Medicaid and that was going to be kind of a push by ODE. Is that still the plan or uh, what's the new would be on that? Well, the goal is still to maximize the amount of districts billing. And there's a lot of political attention right now. Um, I think Senator Wyden sent out a letter um, to all school districts telling them to bill the governor's office is involved. There's a couple of pieces of legislation right now about Medicaid billing. None of it is man. There's nothing about mandatory billing. That's not part of the conversation that I've heard. Yeah. Um, it's just an idea of like, we are in a really big opportunity right now with federal and state changes. We're going to be updating the rules, like looking into removing barriers, increasing participation. So there's still a goal to maximize, but there's not 
I haven't heard any whisper at all of a requirement to build. Conversation, uh, it sounds like can continue forever and ever. And I know we're down to the last couple of minutes. So if anybody else has any last questions, now is your time. And just Chelsea, correct me if I'm, oh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. In early intervention, I think we are required to bill. Correct. It, Sorry. It is I, mandated. You're correct. Huh? In K 12 yeah. setting is not required, but EIE CSE contractors are required per the contract they have with ODE. You're correct. Yeah. And then Chelsea is asking is there uh, a document or place to find what goes into the reimbursement rate per discipline? Or is that, is it what type of service we bill, how often we bill, et cetera? It's about the provider type. So um, there is a cost calculation worksheet that districts submit, districts and EIE CSE programs submit to Lisa Baxter at the Oregon Health Authority every January. And that cost worksheet explains what goes into the rates, like what you can include versus what you can't. And so, um, and you can, it's, there's a spot for nursing, speech, OTPT, you know, all of the things. Um, and then you would just fill out that worksheet based on the services that you want to bill for. Um, the type of service that you bill doesn't impact the rate. It is, if it's a nursing service, you get your nursing rate. If it's a speech service, you get your speech rate uh, and so on. But I could share that cost worksheet with you if you would be interested in checking it out. And Jennifer, who, excuse me, who did you say that cost worksheet is submitted to? Uh, Lisa Baxter. And I know what what agency? Oh, she's she is on contract with the Oregon Health Authority and she's been doing OH, OHA. Like, OK, like 20 okay. years, something like that. Oh. She's doing it. Yeah. Hmm. I would definitely be interested in seeing that because I know our rates last year, like, um, OTs, the reimbursement is less than speech. And I was just wondering what what factors into that. You know, what I can do is connect you with Lisa because she would have some really good ideas on potential ways that you could increase your cost rates. She's really good at helping with that. So would you like that? Yes, please. Okay. And Jennifer, any additional resources that you would like to share with the group? Um, you can get them to me or uh, you can upload them directly into iECHO if you'd like. Um, and then you guys, if you want to check back and and see, I can send out an email or or whatnot, but we'll get you those um, those resources. And, and feel free to reach with questions or if you have anything that you would like, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here. So um, and of course, there, their information, their contact information is available in their bios uh, via the S'more. So go ahead and go on the S'more and you'll find the link to their information. So, and we are out of time for the day. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Right. Jennifer, thank you Thanks so much. <laughs>